Hello again, I'm Kay here in this video. You know about what happened on Christmas Day with that flight Delta, Yemen, okay? Well, you got a lawyer that was amongst that plane who's got some things to tell you and I've uh, got some things to show you, okay? Anybody with any common sense can put this together. Your government, the United States government right now, is busy surrounding Iran. That's what this is really about. The reason they want into Yemen is so that they can have Iran surrounded. Because they're leading you into your third world war right now. Right under your nose, your government's leading you into the third world war so that they can get their one world government. That's what this is really about. Watch what I'm about to show you, and then I'll be right back with you. So, uh, before we boarded, uh, obviously we're in Amsterdam. It was just my wife and I. There weren't any seats in the boarding area, so we, we sat on the floor by what I call, would call the ticket agent, the last person that checks your boarding pass before you board the plane. We're about 10 feet away or so, just playing cards. And, uh, you know, passing time, and I was kind of people watching, and I saw these two men approach the ticket agent, and they just kind of caught my eye because it seemed strange to me that they were together. Uh, one I would describe as uh, he looked like he was a poor uh a black teenager is how I would describe him, 16, 17 years old or so. What I thought was 16 or 17 years old. And the other man looked like a 50-ish, he looked wealthy. Indian, what I would say Indian man now, you know, whether he's of a similar race or something, I don't know. But to me, it, it looked like he was from India. And uh, they approached this ticket agent together. Uh, it was quiet and I could hear the entire conversation. Only the Indian man spoke, not the black man. And what he said was, this man needs to board the plane. He doesn't have a passport. The ticket agent uh, then responded, well, if you don't have a passport, you can't board the plane. Okay, slowly. Um, we we uh, got off the plane. We were held in customs in a, a large baggage claim room, held there for about an hour with only our carry-on bags, all of us together, all the passengers. Bomb-sniffing dogs arrived approximately one hour later. One of the dogs smelled something in the bag of a 30-ish, uh, what I would say, again, an Indian man. He looked like he was from India to me. I, um, the dog sat there like he's trained to do if he finds something. An officer immediately came over and took the man and took the bag into what I would call an interrogation room. Uh, I couldn't see in the room, but I could see the entry door to the room. He was there approximately an hour. He, uh, I saw him come out about an hour later. Uh, he, he was handcuffed and taken away. Uh, immediately after this, uh, we were moved to a different location, and an FBI agent said uh, something close to the following. This isn't an exact quote, but similar. You're being moved to a new location because it's not safe here. I'm sure you all saw what happened and can read between the lines. I, I thought the security after getting off the, the plane was a complete embarrassment, uh, total disorganizational mess that actually put us in more jeopardy than uh, we were already in. Uh, just quickly, two things. They left us on the plane for 20 minutes after we landed, not knowing if there was a bomb anywhere or whether the fire had spread below the floor uh, into the cargo hold or by the gas tank. The, the original fire was directly above the gas tank uh, in row seat 19A, uh, number one. Number two, they should not have left let us take our carry-on bags off the plane, and then even worse, stand all together with them for an hour before the bomb-sniffing dogs got there, not knowing if there was a bomb in any of the bags or not. And it looks like what appeared to be a bomb was discovered by one of the dogs. So those two things made us considerably less safe than we should have been due to what I would call a disorganizational mess. Okay, well, as you've seen there, um, if you listen to what he said, and what happened? He was correct. They could have been in more trouble if there had been a bomb in one of them uh, suitcases that would have ignited or went off. Okay, keeping them on the plane when not knowing about the fire. So see, but this was a complete setup. Every bit of this was a setup. It was staged. It was staged so they could get into Yemen. Why? Because they want to swarm their Iran. Okay. Uh, Dwayne's with me. He's got something he wants to show you. So. Uh, I'm going to let Dwayne show you something here. I'll be right back with you. 
Okay, and thank you for that introductory uh, bill. I th really thank you for that. You're doing a really great job in this video presentation. Now, everybody, I would like you to go to Google.com and type in Iran Map, uh, spelled capital I, lowercase R A N, space M A P, Iran Map. Press Google search results. Here we have the Iranian map. We'll click on that. And here's Iran right here. Now we'll zoom out. And we have a bigger zoom out feature of what the Iran is surrounded by. Look what we have here. We have Iran in the middle. We have Iraq to the left of Iran. We have Afghanistan to the right of Iran. And here's Iraq. Here's Syria. Saudi Arabia. Well, the global elite will pretty much leave Saudi Arabia alone. Here's Yemen down here. This is Yemen. You're going to send U.S. troops over there. And over next door to the right of Yemen, you have Oman, O-M-A-N. And just look at over to, over to Pac the Afghanistan border. What do you've got? You have Pakistan right here, where they're escalating the fake phony war on terror over here. So, But the pretext is to get into Iran, right here in the middle. Iran is right in the middle of the entire Middle Eastern region is Iran. World War III, right here. So you see they're occupying these different Saudi Arabian countries as a build-up to invade Iran. So what Bill is saying in his presentation for you all is pretty much accurate. And until then, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching this uh, Iranian map presentation. If you have any more questions or opinions, feel free to message me over at youtube.com forward slash Dwayne Holloway TV. Uh, D-W-A-Y-N-E-H-O-L-L-O-W-A-Y-T-V. And feel free to leave your comments and opinions and messages, and I'll reply to all those of inquiry. Until then, take it away, Bill, and thank you for watching. Okay, as I've said, we have surrounded Iran. Even when Bush was in office, we were outside of Iran for almost a year and a half. Our government wants into Iran bad. Everything that happened on Christmas Day was staged, purposely done to get into Yemen so that we can surround Iran because they're leading into Third World War. Look in the morning next to this video. Read the links. Open them and read them. Think about what's being said. Watch this news clip. Leave your comments. In the next video, you have a good one. Hi, George Walker Bush. Do something. When George W. Bush took office in 2000, he brought with him Vice President Dick Cheney, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld, and Deputy Secretary for Defense Paul Wolfowitz all of whom had served together previously in the administrations of Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush. Paul Wolfowitz, in particular, had long been recognized as the intellectual force behind a radical neoconservative fringe of the Republican Party. For years, Wolfowitz had been advancing the idea that the United States should reconsider its commitments to international treaties, international law, and multilateral organizations such as the United Nations. A radical plan for American military domination first surfaced during the administration of George H.W. Bush. In 1992, Paul Wolfowitz, working in the Department of Defense, was asked to write the first draft of a new national security strategy, a document entitled The Defense Planning Guidance. The most controversial elements of what would later come to be known as the Wolfowitz Doctrine were that the United States should dramatically increase defense spending, that it should be willing to take preemptive military action, and that it should be willing to use military force unilaterally, with or without allies. This new reliance on military force was necessary, according to Wolfowitz, to prevent the emergence of any future or potential rivals to American power and to secure access to vital resources, especially Persian Gulf oil. William Out of power during the Clinton presidency, Wolfowitz and his colleagues affiliated themselves with a number of influential conservative think tanks. In 2000, they would craft yet another proposed national security strategy. This one published by a right-wing think tank, calling itself the project for the new American century. At its core, the document revived the Wolfowitz Doctrine. It called on the United States to increase the military budget by up to a hundred billion dollars, to deny other nations the use of outer space, 
and to adopt a more aggressive and unilateral foreign policy that would allow the United States to act offensively and preemptively in the world. The elimination of states like Iraq figured prominently in this grand vision. But even these hardline conservatives knew that the Wolfowitz Doctrine was likely too radical to win the support of the foreign policy establishment, their own Republican Party, and the American people. In their defining document, written in September of 2000, a full year before 9-11, they acknowledged that the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one. Absent, in their own chilling words, some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor. One year later, that event would arrive.